Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. Today's video topic was highly requested in the comments section on my video on literacy and learning from the end of last year, which I will be leaving linked. In that video, I made passing reference to Margaret Roper, formerly Margaret Moore, said to be the favourite child of Sir, or Saint, Thomas More. And at some point I will do a whole video on the father, I think, but today it's the daughter's turn in the spotlight. So, let's try and meet Margaret. Margaret was the first-born child of Thomas More and his first wife, Jane, whose maiden name was Colt. Margaret's date of birth is thought to be in October 1505, but she was soon joined by her siblings. Elizabeth came next in 1506. Then there was Sicily in 1507. And lastly, there was their brother, John, who was born in 1509. Reportedly, this was a very happy household. The family were based in London near what is now Mansion House. But their happiness would be challenged in the summer of 1511, when Margaret would have been around six years old, because at that point, Margaret's mother died. Within a month, Margaret had a new stepmother, Alice. She was the widow of the wealthy London merchant, John Middleton. Alice and John had had a daughter together, who was also called Alice, and she had been born in around 1501. So, within weeks of losing her mother, little Margaret Moore had a new mother figure and an older stepsister. At around the same time, she also ceased being the only Margaret under her father's roof because her kinswoman, Margaret Giggs, arrived to live as her adopted or rather foster sister. Despite this loss and the upheavals of these changes to Margaret's home life, there remains little to indicate that her childhood was anything other than happy, loving and supportive. Margaret and the other children were offered the opportunity of an enviable education as well. Thomas More was a gifted and well-connected scholar and he taught and also employed tutors to teach those that resided in his care. More shaped for his family a comprehensive and varied curriculum. Margaret, in particular, was said to have been the one to especially flourish in this environment. She would soon grow into a young woman whose scholarship and intellect would be recognised and lionised in the most rarefied of circles. Because at her father's school, Margaret, or Meg, as Thomas would affectionately refer to her, studied Latin and Greek. She read the writings of the early church theologians. She also studied astronomy, philosophy, theology, geometry and arithmetic. Thomas More is often credited with popularising a more robust form of female education and he presented this as a way to support a daughter's ongoing piety, morality and virtue. Margaret's father's original calling was to a life of study, but his king increasingly began to rely on and favour him. This fact drew more towards a public life that, with increasing frequency, took him away from home. And while Moore certainly remained focused on the progress of his school at home, the practicalities of day-to-day -day education were presumably the concern of the tutors that Moore had handpicked and employed for the task. Nevertheless, members of the Moore family were encouraged to write Thomas in Latin every day, and this would certainly have allowed him to discern their academic progress more clearly, or indeed any lack of progress. Margaret need not worry, because Margaret's letters were reportedly a source of great pride for her father. When going about his own and his monarch's business, Thomas carried exemplars of Margaret's missives with him so he could show them off. Margaret Boker highlights how impressive these letters actually were by recounting how, quote, Reginald Pole in 1521, so when Margaret would have been around 16, could not believe they were hers. 
John Vasey, Bishop of Exeter, sent her a golden coin for one. Unfortunately, very few of Margaret's letters survive. At around the time that Margaret's letters were being poured over and praised by the likes of Reginald Pohl, Margaret was preparing to embark on her next phase in life, marriage. William Roper was around seven years older than Margaret, but seemingly was no stranger to her, because it's thought that he entered Sir Thomas More's household in around 1518, at the time when he would have been entering Lincoln's Inn. Certainly, William was recorded as being a law student who resided in the Moore household. Margaret and William married under a licence that was issued on the 2nd of July 1521. But despite their marriage, the couple did remain under Sir Thomas's roof, and this would end up resulting in some tension, particularly when William found himself called to explore vernacular scripture and the teachings of Martin Luther. Embarrassingly, this fact came to the attention of the wider community and William found himself called before Cardinal Wolsey to answer to a charge of heresy. Indeed, it is said that it was his connection to Margaret's father that saved him from being given more than a friendly warning. Just what William's father-in-law, that most famous pursuer of heretics and heresy, would have thought of his son-in-law being charged with this is not formally recorded. Although it is reported that Moore frequently tried to reason, argue and cajole William back into the Roman Catholic fold, all of which proved unsuccessful and caused Thomas to resort to praying for God's own intervention in the case. Apparently, Prayer proved to be just the ticket, because William is said to have eventually returned to Catholic obedience and to have remained there for the rest of his life. We can but wonder how Margaret must have felt about these religious tensions that existed between her father and her husband, but I'd imagine that it must have been very uncomfortable, especially as Margaret was still in her teens while this was all kicking off and happening. Equally, It'd be my guess that she must have felt nothing but relief when her father's prayers seemed to have their intended effect. Within two years of her marriage in 1523, Margaret was preparing to give birth to her first child. Her father wrote to her and included the following hopes about his grandchild. We pray most earnestly that all may go happily and successfully with you. May God and our blessed lady grant you happily and safely to increase your family by a little one, like to his mother in everything except sex. Yet, let it by all means be a girl, if only she will make up for the inferiority of her sex by her zeal to imitate her mother's virtue and learning. Such a girl I should prefer to three boys. Whatever Sir Thomas might or might not have preferred, Margaret's first child would be a girl, who was named Elizabeth. About a year after this birth, so in around 1524, Margaret, William and baby Elizabeth would accompany the wider Moore clan, which now included some more spouses too, when they made their house move to Chelsea. At Chelsea, the Roper family would be joined by more children. There was Mary, Thomas, Margaret, and then Anthony. Like their mother, these children benefited from the school that had been shaped by Sir Thomas, which had also moved to Chelsea. And they enjoyed this schooling alongside their cousins. Within a decade, Margaret's home life had utterly shifted. But it was not just her personal, intimate relationships that had been altered. Her father's professional life was also transformed and this change must have, I think, felt seismic to the whole family. Thomas More became a privy councillor to Henry VIII in 1518. In the same year, he was made master of requests as well. In 1521, he became under treasurer of the exchequer and also the king's private secretary. In 1525, he was made Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, but his most auspicious role came in 1529, when he was made Lord Chancellor. This is the highest ranking office in the realm, and it's a clear sign of the esteem, trust and preferment 
that was being shown to him by the king. While this no doubt represented a significant change, that doesn't mean that we should read Thomas More as having been an obscure person before it took place, because he had also enjoyed and continued to enjoy a celebrated international reputation for his humanist scholarship. His scholastic reputation was, however, jeopardised by this growing prominence in Henry's court and his increasing state service. And this is because worldly concerns were believed in some circles to be incompatible with the spiritual and scholastic demands of true scholarship. To safeguard his reputation, effort had to be exerted to insinuate that these state duties were unsought, even unwelcome, and that his personal commitment to humanism was the true foundation of his identity. It certainly helped that Thomas More had Erasmus in his corner, but it was Margaret that would prove emblematic of her father's humanism. The English-born theologian and faithful Roman Catholic Thomas Stapleton saw echoes of the relationship enjoyed by St Augustine and his son in the bond between Margaret and her father. Writing during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, Stapleton stated that, quote, As St Augustine had his adiodatus, whose admirable talents he could never sufficiently admire, so had more his Margaret. Jamie Goodrich points out that this positioning of Margaret as essentially the keeper of her father's humanist credentials, quote, a dutiful daughter who privately mirrored her father's interests, is a picture that has so troubled feminist critics. However, Goodrich continues, John Guy has recently demonstrated that the early biographers mixed fact and folklore to heighten Moore's saintliness which suggests that their portrait of Roper is also out of focus. These biographers continue to propagate the image that Moore and his allies constructed Roper as a symbol of her father's private commitment to humanism. In doing so, Moore and his colleagues and his biographers all give Roper a public standing and political efficacy belied by her apparently personal voice. I think that we're starting to see that Margaret's reputation is complicated, potentially even obscured, because she is effectively a propaganda tool, something that is used as scaffolding for her father's international reputation. Nevertheless, it's also clear to me that Margaret, on her own terms and by her own merit, was extraordinarily learned. And that she was celebrated accordingly. We can see this if we look at the man who was responsible for shaping Mary Tudor's educational programme, Juan Luis Vives, because he references the Moor women in his text, The Education of a Christian Woman, from 1523. And you can find this reference in Book One, which treats of unmarried women. Here, Vives explains, quote, I shall mention the daughters of Thomas More, Margaret, Elizabeth, Cecilia, and their kinswoman, Margaret Giggs, whose father was not content that they be chaste, but also took pains that they be very learned, in the belief that in this way they would be more truly and steadfastly chaste. The education of these women, and by extension of all women, is thus presented as a path to moral victory. Equally, that most famed humanist scholar Erasmus presented the education of Margaret and the other women in the Moore household as an exemplar most worthy of being followed. And he does this in a letter to Boudet in September of 1521. Just two years later, in 1523, Erasmus dedicates his commentary on Prudentius to Margaret. Then, in 1523, In Erasmus's new edition of his Colloquies, he includes a dialogue entitled The Abbot and the Learned Lady. This dialogue features the character Magdalia. Jamie Goodrich feels that this choice of character name might have been an intentional echo of that pet name that Margaret's father gave her, Meg. 
Additionally, Erasmus's Magdalia names the Moor ladies as veritable paragons of female learning. However, as the European Reformation began to gain momentum, Erasmus chose to take up the arguably measured and logical, but ultimately very unpopular position of trying to locate a middle way. The Catholic Church, he felt, was certainly beset by abuses and thus in need of reform. However, Erasmus was not willing to renounce his belief in the need for papal authority or its justification, so he wasn't going to be popular in either camp. Indeed, there were some religious conservatives who felt that Erasmus's criticism of the Roman Catholic Church was the thing that had paved the way for Martin Luther's own complaints in his 95 Theses of 1517, and thus that Erasmus was in large part responsible for the spread of reforming arguments and reformation. It was also rumoured that Erasmus was the true author of Martin Luther's vitriolic response to Henry VIII's defence of the seven sacraments. And perhaps a little awkwardly, Margaret's father assisted Henry in the creation of that very text. Despite this controversy and conflict, Margaret chose to translate Erasmus's Procatio Dominica into English, and going one step further, her translation was then published in 1525 as a devout treatise upon the Paternoster. And although her name was not officially attached to this publication, her anonymity as the true translator was so thin that it was basically transparent that she was in fact the, quote, young, virtuous and well-learned gentlewoman of 19 years of age that is referenced in this title page. It's worth mentioning that we think that Margaret was probably 20 years old when it was actually published. This translation and its publication have been viewed as Margaret showing her support for Erasmus publicly, because in it, she seeks to present Erasmus's orthodoxy in relation to the Roman Catholic faith and its doctrine. She also supports and furthers his aim to end the division or schism in the church for which Lutheranism is blamed in the text. And additionally, she asserts the spiritual value of the humanist's classical study. However, it has by extension been argued that this is the sort of thing that her father would or indeed must have approved of for her to proceed. People feel that perhaps... Margaret is actually showing the public support that her father privately felt, but that he was unable to show because of the suspicion that had attached itself to Erasmus and how that would have affected Moore's public role, responsibilities and loyalties. In England, Lutheranism and indeed anything in the Lutheran wheelhouse was heresy. And the text and for that matter the people, who were thought to be spreading it, risked being seized and destroyed. Thomas More led raids to seek out heretics and heretical material. The anonymous translation of Erasmus that was made by Margaret was apparently one of the unlicensed texts that were seized. Her publisher, Thomas Berthollet, was investigated for this and his other unapproved publications. Funnily enough, it seems that Margaret avoided similar scrutiny. In around 1527, Margaret sat for Hans Holbein the Younger's study for a now lost but much copied family portrait of the Moore family. Here we have it. From left to right, we have Margaret's sister Elizabeth. Next to her is Margaret Giggs, who is that relative who came to live with the family as a foster or adoptive sister. Margaret Giggs stands beside a seated John Moore. This is Margaret's grandfather. Thomas Moore is seated beside his father. The girl standing between and behind them is Anne Cresacre, and she is the fiancé of Margaret's brother, John. He stands on the other side of his father. Henry Pattinson, Moore's jester, stands beside the younger John Moore. Margaret's other sister, Cecilia, kneels in front of Patterson and beside Margaret herself. The final figure, who is seated on the right of the image, is Margaret's stepmother, Alice. 
This drawing returned to Basel with Holbein at the end of 1528, and it would end up being given to Erasmus as a gift from Moore. Erasmus was said to be very grateful for it. Roland Lockie produced this copy of the finished but now lost painting in 1592. Margaret's translation of Erasmus was republished in 1531, which was around the time that the king was becoming publicly less and less convinced of the Pope's authority. This was a change of heart that, in conjunction with other stresses, would end up costing Margaret and her family a very great deal. Margaret's father's conscience would apparently not permit him to fully support Henry VIII in his divorce from Catherine of Aragon, particularly in his growing belief and eventual claim to spiritual authority over the Church of England. Thomas More resigned as Henry's Lord Chancellor in 1532, claiming poor health, and also a desire to retreat from worldly concerns of public life back to the private humanist endeavours that had made him famous in the first place. In March 1534, the Act of Succession was passed. This bastardised Mary and removed her as her father's heir while recognising Elizabeth in her place instead. In addition, the Act required that any subject, if commanded, was to swear an oath which recognised both this Act of Succession and also Henry's supremacy within the Church. On the 12th of April 1534, Margaret's father refused to swear his allegiance to the Act of Succession. Part of the oath included the rejection of papal authority, which apparently Moore's conscience would not permit him to swear to. Thomas was imprisoned in the Tower of London five days later, on the 17th of April. Margaret and the rest of the Moore family were, however, content to swear the oath. Her compliance with the demands of the state did not, seemingly, affect her relationship with her father. Instead, it filled the government with hope that she might prove inspirational for her father and lead him to comply in a similar way. Letters were allowed to pass between them, and they were permitted to meet in person. There are accounts of her trying desperately to persuade her father to take the oath, and indeed the one that would follow it. But her motivation in these acts is, however, hotly debated, because there are those who view it as a genuinely terrified attempt to save the father she loved from being physically destroyed for following his conscience, while others suggest that her own oath-swearing may simply have been about securing access to her father's person and works so that she might transmit his thoughts and his version of events beyond his cell in the tower. Margaret's unsuccessful attempts to convince her father to swear sits alongside her continued capacity to share his rhetoric as a way of shaping the foundation of his martyrdom, because he is being shown as being resolute in his refusal due to his conscience, and this is despite the impassioned pleadings of this most favoured and beloved child. At the same time, he is also producing a textual output, which Margaret is disseminating, that so befitted the legacy of one as learned as him. If we return to Goodrich, quote, Margaret Roper verified Moore's spiritual immovability and established Moore's imprisonment as a reclusive withdrawal from secular concerns. But through this, she is also being positioned in opposition to her father. Margaret's calls for him to swear the oath speaks to her worldly concern for his physical body, so she is positioned as encouraging, arguably tempting him, to set aside his spiritual calling and his moral principles. Now, there are a few websites where you can look at some of the letters that Margaret's father sent to her while he was imprisoned in the Tower, including his last letter to her. I think that that might drag the focus of this video away from Margaret and towards her father if I were to go into them here and now. However, they are an interesting and really useful resource, so I'm going to split the difference. And I'm going to link each of the letters from the Tower in the description box for this video. In November 1534, the Act of Supremacy was passed. 
King Henry VIII was now officially supreme head of the church in England, and there was to be another oath to swear in relation to this change too. Once again, Margaret's father refused. He was put on trial on the 1st of July 1535 and found guilty. He was executed for treason on the 6th of July 1535. This miniature of Margaret dates from around the time of her father's trial and execution. It's thought to have been produced between 1535 and 1536. The artist who is painting her is once again Hans Holbein the Younger. Now, granted, eight or nine years have elapsed between Holbein's sketch of Margaret for the Moore family portrait and this one, but I still feel like we are seeing the toll that her father's imprisonment, trial and execution have taken on her. In the miniature, her former confidence seems to have been dented and, at least to me, she now looks gaunt, hunched, nervous, exhausted even. Although with that last part, the looking exhausted, that could of course be attributed to having and then raising five children. Still, I do think a change is evident in these images and I think that change is grief. But what do you think? After her father's execution, which shocked and horrified those both at home and abroad, Margaret allegedly went into preservation mode. Thomas Stapleton made a record of what happened when Margaret was called before the authorities to answer for her behaviour. He recounts how, quote, Margaret Roper was brought before the King's Council and charged with keeping her father's head as a sacred relic and retaining possession of his books and writings. She answered that she had saved her father's head from being devoured by the fishes with the intention of burying it. The head had been impaled on London Bridge that she had hardly any books and papers but what had already been published, except a very few personal letters, which she humbly begged to be allowed to keep for her own consolation. It is inferred that the head in the Roper family vault at St Dunstan's Church, Canterbury, is that of Sir Thomas More. It's alleged that, at least for a time, Margaret had her father's head preserved on display in her home. And this was risky because it's a potential talisman around which opposition to the Tudor regime and its policies might ferment. The making of martyrs is bad business when you're a monarch. Whatever her private intentions, it seems that Margaret isn't particularly worried about discretion because it certainly seems to me that she is poking the bear here. And in spite of this, or perhaps because of this, The rest of Margaret's life passes in near total obscurity. Well, at least it does as far as we students of history are concerned. Margaret Roper died at Chelsea in the summer of 1544. It has been suggested that childbirth may have been her cause of death. And if this is the case, it would appear that the child also did not survive as there are no records that mention their existence. Her husband, William, would never remarry. Margaret was, at least at first, buried, holding her father's head in Chelsea Church, and she remained there until William's own death 34 years later, when her burial, including presumably her father's head, was moved to St Dunstan's Canterbury, where it was reinterred beside her husband. Margaret's legacy is, I'd argue, for better or worse, inextricably tied up to that of her father's. She is his Meg, his very favourite child, his best student and his letter-writing partner. And perhaps this is to be expected when your father has been executed for treason and is recognised in some quarters as a saint. Equally, it doesn't help that so much of her work has been lost to us. I mean, we have her translation of Erasmus, that devout treatise upon the Paternoster, but we only have a small proportion of her letters those letters for which she was so celebrated from her very earliest years, and her lost work is sizeable. According to Jane Williams, quote, she wrote many Latin epistles and English letters, and an original treatise on the four last things, and she translated the ecclesiastical history of Eusebius from the Greek into the Latin language. 
I do wonder whether we would view Margaret differently or even be able to know her a little better if these works of hers were still available to us and also if her life wasn't essentially overshadowed by her father's fall and execution. But what do you think? How does Margaret come across for you? Do you wish, as I do, that we just had access to a little bit more about her for us to go on? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video, or you can find me over on social media. I'll leave links to the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box. Follow me over on some or all of them so we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, why not share it with your friends? Please also let me know you liked it by hitting the thumbs up. Please do subscribe to the channel and I am aware that YouTube is still unsubscribing people so please have a check now. Make sure you're still subscribed if you think you are. And while you're there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, why not hit the bell icon beside the subscribe button and in the drop down select all so that YouTube will tell you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day whatever you're doing and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.